Good morning. Great. Um, great to have you all here. Russ, we got you some Northern Virginia type weather so you'd feel right at home. Uh, you know, it's been 70 and sunny till you got in town. Uh, but no, just teasing. Uh, we had uh, a little prelude last night uh, and a, in a smaller group and heard Russ and uh, I told him this morning, I said, that's all my wife kept talking about last night. He said, you have an unusual wife. Uh, I said, no, she's married to an economist, and uh, she loves to talk about the economy, political economy, uh, and uh, she meant it sincerely, Russ. She really had a great time last night, and you were, you were magnificent. Uh, today is the inaugural uh, lecture supported by our good friend at Andrews Distributing, Mike McGuire, right here. Mike, would you stand up and we were <laughs> say thank you? Mike's one of ours. He's a, he's a graduate of our executive MBA program uh, and running things at Andrews uh, and passionate about markets and freedom and, and helping us in the O'Neill Center. Uh, we launched the O'Neill Center in 2008. I was very fortunate to hire someone I already knew, someone who had been involved in SMU for many years, Michael Cox. Michael, for many years, was the chief economist at the Dallas Fed. But also, back in 99, I believe it was 1999, wrote a book, Myths of the Rich and Poor. And I came across that book when I was in Little Rock, Arkansas, and Warren Stevens gave me two copies. And he said, this is the best book ever written about economics. And I said, well, why are you giving me two? He said, well, one's for you, and pass the other one on. And then tell them to go buy two and pass one on. So uh, that's how we got connected. I looked up Michael, and we became good buds. And when he was ready to leave the Fed, I brought him here to head up the O'Neill Center, the O'Neill Center for Global Markets and Freedom, which is germane to what we're going to talk about today. So, Michael, I'll let you come up and introduce our distinguished speaker. Well, I wasn't ready to leave the Fed until uh, Al and I got together with the, at a, what turned out to be a, a, a fateful meeting. He called me over and said, hey, let's have lunch. And uh, then I was ready to go. <laughs> And I'm so happy I left one ship and moved to the other. One seems to be sinking, and the other one is getting to be a, a cruise ship now, <laughs> thanks to Al's <laughs> leadership. Um, as America marches n not far now behind Greece on the road to serfdom, most of my economist colleagues either sit idly by or hasten the march by advocating more government spending, more regulation, or there's some other form of uh, activist government policy. They point to their fancy mathematical models or to their econometrics or to some study or whatever, all of which glorify government as our benevolent rescuer. This approach didn't work in the Great Depression. It's the cause of Japan's two lost decades, now almost three, and it's my pro yet it's my profession's recommendation for how we uh, get out of this uh, lingering slump. So as you might guess, there are very few of my colleagues who I admire or want to emulate. And this includes uh, those who are in the limelight through positions of government power, such as Ben Bernanke, Timothy Geithner, Larry Summers, and so on. I can name a lot of big-name economists who I absolutely don't want to be like. But this list does not include Russell Roberts. Ask me who I want to be like. It's that man we're sitting right there, <laughs> Russell Roberts, yeah, whom I, great, I really look up to. The man sitting right here is a, 19, is a 21st century Frederick Bastiai. Now, if you know Frederick Bastiai, he was a 19th century economic pamphleteer, a Frenchman, who through his brilliant short writings and his gift at communicating made fools out of French's protectionist government policies and went on to, back then, save, save France from making big mistakes. Uh, Bastiai's works have survived to this day and indeed are perhaps even more popular today with those who read. Right, But as new generations come along with new technologies and different societal norms, fewer 20 and 30-somethings out there read, as it turns out, and more watch videos or text or tweet. So if we are, are to rescue young Americans from the sweet tunes of our modern-day economist Pied Pipers, then we must communicate with them, the youngsters, the way they listen. This is why I so greatly admire Russ. He does that. He's the best at it. He's a great teacher for those of us who want to learn how to communicate more effectively with this generation. And he presents truth, 
not just ideological dogma that, uh, uh, that uh, the other side is, is doing, and he truly cares about America. So just by way of, you know, Russ to catch up really quick on why I say this about his communication. Well, for, first, Russ is a professor now at George Mason University. He holds a distinguished fellow at Mercatus Chair for the F, Lillian F. Smith Distinguished Fellow. Uh, he's also a research fellow at Stanford. He's got rap videos, numerous ones, which have a combined audience of about four million, the most popular, which is Keynes versus Hayek second round, which all of you should see if you haven't. He's the host of Econ Talk, an hour-long award-winning podcast with over 300 episodes archived on the web. I'm skipping a lot of stuff here. Uh, he's author of three works of, of fiction, my most uh, popular um, um, favorite of which is The Choice, a great s small book, very effective. He's a frequent guest on National Public Radio, writes for the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, um, and um, we've got his PhD at University of Chicago, and how, how I wish I could say that. I mean, it's, uh, it's a bastion of free market economics. So, Russ, without further ado, please come up, and, and we, we're so happy you're here. Thank you, Michael, and uh, your book is a great book, and I'm, I'm honored to be, uh, to be told I'm somebody you look up to and you'd like to be like, but I'm only 5'6", so you might want to kind of pick <clears throat> the parts that you want to look up to and be like. Um, I'm also honored to be compared to Frederick Bastiat, one of my favorite economists. I, I never really thought about it, but pamphleteer is something, I, I guess that's kind of what I am. And, uh, it, it doesn't, uh, it, it, it's a cool thing. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, something, the central idea in my last book, which is The Price of Everything. And it's an idea that's alien to most of us. Uh, economists think about it more than other folks, but it doesn't really come naturally even to economists. And my theme today is that there is, <coughs> there's order built into the fabric of the world. And we understand this in certain places, certain parts of our lives. So when the seasons change and the earth goes around the sun, we know we don't have to lean into the curve, right? There isn't a memo that goes out and says, hey, guys, spring's coming. So, you know, just takes place naturally. We totally take it for granted. So that's one kind of order. There's a related kind at a smaller scale in our bodies, right? We breathe, you don't have to consciously breathe. We don't have to tell our blood to coagulate if we cut ourselves. We have this incredible orderly system, it's just, it's just an amazing thing. So that kind of order, which is either a work of nature or God, that kind of order we understand and we totally take for granted. There's another kind of order in our lives, or disorder, if, we, if we're not careful, that we control. So. We let the dishes pile up in the sink, and then we do them. But they don't do themselves. And we got a plan, and you have to act on that plan. You got to set aside time to do the dishes. You got to set aside time to rake the leaves in your yard. They're not like the earth going around the sun. They don't rake themselves, those leaves. You got to make a conscious deci decision to rake the leaves. So we have order that comes from natural sources, and we have order that comes from human activity. But there's a third kind of order that is the alien kind, the kind that is really the study of, of what economics is really about. And that's order that comes from our actions. It comes from human beings making decisions. But no one is in charge of those decisions. And no one is consciously making those decisions. And yet it comes out in an orderly way, as if a mastermind was actually running the system the way the Earth looks like it's run the way your body looks like it has a system that's being organized and, and working in, a, in an orderly way. So I want to talk about some different examples of this human order. Uh, what Adam Ferguson, the uh, Scottish uh, political economist of the 18th century called the product of human action, but not human design. So it looks designed, but it isn't designed by humans, even though we cause it. That's a very strange idea. So I want to talk about a few examples of that. So I want to start with an example that we all understand, straightforward. I go to uh, 
I go to Blockbuster. Does it still exist? You know, in my mind, it, it's nearby. I know where it used to be. I don't know if, I think they're gone, the, the, but maybe they're not all gone. But in the old days, back in the early years of the 21st century, my, on a Saturday night, my sons and I, or my sons and daughter, when she was still in the house, we'd go out to the Blockbuster and we'd pick out a movie. And we'd have a debate. We'd have a discussion. I'd want to watch uh, Toy Story 3, and they want to watch Finding Nemo, and I don't really like Finding Nemo that much. And, they, and we discuss it, and we finally we make a decision. And my wife says, would you guys, when I come walking through the door, my wife says, would you decide? Well, we decided on Finding Nemo. And you know exactly what I mean by that statement. We decided. We don't know all the mechanics of it, but you know there was maybe some give and take. There might be a compromise. It could be unanimous. We might have had to vote. We could have had a quid pro quo where I say, okay, guys, Finding Nemo this week, but next week, High Noon. Great movie, by the way, that my kids aren't as interested as I am, but, you know, it's part of my job is to keep them educated. So we understand what that decision's about. Or my wife and I are trying to decide, should we go to the mountains or to the beach for a vacation? We might take turns. One of us, we might both like the beach. We choose the beach. So when we say, oh, when someone says, where'd you have a history? Well, we weren't sure, but we decided on the beach. You know exactly what I mean. Again, you don't know every nuance. You, don't understand. you might not know all the discussions and how, well, I felt kind of bad that I got my way this time, so I made sure I went. Right? You don't understand the nuance but the detail, and the details, but the phrase, oh, we decided on the beach, you have a pretty good idea what I mean by that. So who decided that Google is a verb? Who made that decision? Because Google is a verb. If I say, I'm going to Google that later, or I Googled that last night, you know exactly what I mean, and it's totally acceptable everyday usage that no one goes, Google, isn't that a search? Right? You don't do that. It's just part of our vocabulary. Why is that OK? Who decided it's OK to use that corporation as a verb or a noun, but you can't use Enron to mean an unethical moron? Now, wouldn't that be a useful phrase? Oh, boy, was he an Enron. Right? You can't use that. If, if I do, you're going to, what do you mean he's an Enron? What does that mean? Oh, it means an unethical moron. Have you ever heard that before? That phrase, for some reason, hasn't caught on. So we've decided, and I could use this Enron all day long today, and it still wouldn't work. I wouldn't get it into the vocabulary. I could try really hard, but we've evidently decided that, en that Enron is not a noun to describe an unethical moron. Just like we've also decided Example I love, meat space. Some people here know what meat space is. Say, none of you. What's wrong with you? Don't you know what meat space means? If you Google meat space, you will find it. It's a phrase. It's an ugly, disgusting phrase. It means this world as opposed to virtual reality. Right? So, well, in, in the virtual world, I do this. But in meat space, ugh, meat space? It's kind of disgusting. So it didn't catch on. We decided. Who decided that meat space isn't a good word to use? We did. How? It's not the same way we decide on going to the beach for a vacation or watch Finding Nemo. There's no time where we get together and argue about it, take a vote, come to a consensus, make a deal. It just somehow emerges that some words are OK and some words aren't. We all know what ruthless means, right? So you can say, boy, is he ruthless. But you can't say, he's got a lot of Ruth. But you used to be able to. Ruth used to mean compassionate, nice, and kind. He's full of Ruth. You could say that, but you can't anymore. No one knows what you're talking about. It's not good English. It's literally good English, but not in the real sense of what good English means. So how do those things take place? Who decides that it catches on? And we know. And by the way, Google, the company, doesn't want Google used as a verb. I have a friend who works at Google. If you use Google as a, as a verb in a memo, you get corrected. Because that's degrading the trademark of the company. They don't like it. But guess what? They can't stop it. They can wave signs. They can protest. They can write editorials that it's wrong. You should just search through the computer instead of Google or search using a search engine. They can't stop it. So how does that process work? Well, we know something about it. It's word of mouth. And some things are more useful than others. And we understand how that happens. But what's the verb to describe that process? So you're OK with me saying, we decided that Google is a verb. But you have to recognize that there's nothing in that phrase, we decided, that corresponds to other decisions we make where we know what that means. And that's a weird thing. So I ask you, 
How's that work? Does it work pretty well or does it work pretty badly? It works pretty well. The evolution of the English language, it's alive. You could argue, well, it'd be worked better if we had a committee. Because then they could get rid of some really useless things like debt. Debt should be spelled D-E-T, don't you think? Right? The B is just a waste of space. Right? It's a waste. We should just get rid of it. If we had a vote, we'd all agree that B should go. But there is no way to do that. So the B of debt and a thousand other or you might say, I wish we had Ruth back. Let's vote on that today. But that's not how it works. So you might think, well, it'd be better if somebody steered the English language instead of just letting it kind of take its own path. You know, words get created, words end. One of my favorite dead words besides Ruth is elemosinary. Does anybody know what that means? Yep, some people know what elemosinary, not many, and, and, and in 100 years there'll be fewer. Elemo, elemosinary means charity, charitable. It's an old-fashioned word. I, I only learned it because I heard Milton Friedman say it. He used it to describe charitable activity. It's dying out. Most people who know it are either older or in the real estate business, because real estate often has an illimosinary exemption. And so in legal language, that word still persists. But those are, are, it's archaic. It's archaic. I used to use behoove as an example of this. I'd say, nobody says anymore, it behooves you. But they do. Every once in a while, you'll hear behoove. It's hanging on. It's got a chance. It may make it. But we don't sit around and have a debate about how this should work. So you think maybe better to have a committee. Keep the who for a little longer. Ruth comes back. Misspell, change the way debt spelled. Fix the grammar. It's so complicated. It's tough on foreigners, right? We could have a committee. But it turns out, you'd have to th when you think about it, how would that committee work? How would it spread its decisions? Who would be the deciders? Who would monitor whether the committee was being followed or not? Why would anyone listen to it? Because the French have a committee. The French Academy, the Academy Francaise, excuse me, my Bastia section, uh, has, there's 40 members, and I love this. They call themselves, this is, uh, over the years, especially with the financial crisis, I've gotten increasingly skepti skeptical of experts. Uh, and people who claim to know stuff, and I've become increasingly uh, be to believe that we don't know very much about anything, uh, and we should be more humble. But not the French. Uh, that's never been their strong suit. The, the 40 members of the Academy Francaise are called les immortels, which I think means the immortals, uh, <laughs> as far as I can tell. It's a nice group to be in. You'd think they'd be pretty powerful. Uh, their job is to, is to decide what is good French and what is not good French. So the French phrase for Saturday and Sunday, according to the Académie Française, is fin de semaine, end of the week. No French person calls Saturday and Sunday fin de semaine. They call it le weekend, <laughs> which, which annoys the Académie Française, the immortals. We mere mortals. We, we, I don't know what the French version of it is. We, uh, we thumb our nose at the immortals, and we say the weekend, uh, the French do. They can't stop it. They can issue all the decrees they want, but they can't control it. So no one's in charge of English. Most, no one's in charge of any language. The French Academy may think they are. And it works pretty well. It works pretty well through this strange process of word of mouth, you and I weighing what words are good words, and things catch on, other things die out. Let's look at something that's a little more important. OK, a lot more important than whether Google should be a verb. Who decides how many different jobs there are, and who are the people who do those jobs? That's very important. <clears throat> who decides how many web designers there'll be this year or five years from now? How many cab drivers? How many school teachers? How many doctors? How many math teachers? How many pediatricians? How many sushi chefs should there be? It's a good uh, tongue twister. How many sushi chefs should there be in, say, Biloxi, Mississippi? There's no committee. There's no board of jobs or committee of careers. Who makes those decisions? And the answer, of course, is we do. We decide how many people do those different tasks. But that's really not the word that it's the best word we have. It captures something, but it doesn't really capture what's going on. And it's nothing like the way Google is decided to be a verb. The two uses of the word decide in the Google case and in the number of jobs, the only thing they really have in common is that there isn't a good word or phrase to describe the process, so we're stuck with we decide. So if you think about Biloxi, Mississippi, think about it now for most of human history, 
Biloxi, Mississippi had zero sushi chefs. It's not a big cuisine in the history of Mississippi, right? But at some point, somebody had to take a chance and move there, probably, or at least invest in and start a sushi restaurant. And you'd have to, you could ask yourself, since we don't do it this way, we do it in this emergent, bottom-up way, but we could do it through a committee. You could have a committee decide to allocate the sushi chefs. How many should be in Biloxi? How many in Tupelo? How many in Pascagoula? How many in et cetera? And if you decided there should be, let's say, 10, where would they come from? Think how complicated that is. Should you take them from another city that has too many? Or maybe you should expand the entire pool of sushi chefs so that Biloxi can get its 10. Now, it turns out Biloxi has a population of about 50,000. They have six sushi restaurants, according to my casual research on Google Maps. <laughs> Now, it's a vacation and resort, and resort area, so it probably is not typical of the Mississippi town of 50,000. Uh, Tupelo has 36,000 people. Uh, it has, uh, does not have a sushi restaurant, but it has a Japanese steakhouse where you can get sushi. Pascagoula, which is under 25,000, has no sushi uh, officially that I can find on Google Maps, but it's a 22-minute ride to Wasabi, uh, a sushi spot in neighboring Ocean Springs. If you start to think about how the actual number of six turned out in Biloxi and how that got determined and who influenced it, it's a mind-boggling array of human beings. It includes, if you said to yourself, well, well, let me ask a different way. Is six a good number? You say, well, you know, it seems like a pretty good number because it's, it's more than Pascagoula and it's more than Tupelo and it's probably less than Jackson, and it's less in turn than Dallas, and that's less in turn than Manhattan, and that's less in turn than Tokyo. So you can say this process, whatever it is, this weird process that no one's in charge of where there is no committee, it's working pretty well. And then you'd have to ask yourself, well, how do you know it's working pretty well? I mean, it's a crude measure to say, well, more in certain places than others. That seems logical. It seems like a pretty good idea there should be more in Biloxi than Tupelo and more in Manhattan than Biloxi, but that's a pretty crude metric, right? That's not a very comforting, maybe we could do a lot better with the committee. And you start to ask yourself, well, how would that committee make that decision of how many to be and where they'd come from? Think about the information you'd want to have. You'd want to know something about how much people in Biloxi like sushi, right? How would you get that information? And certainly the answer, think about just that simplest, it's only one little piece of the puzzle. How much, to, how much sushi do people in Biloxi want to eat on a weekly, monthly, or yearly basis? And the answer, to answer that question, give me, give me some help. Or what are some of the things you'd want to know to figure that out? What would you want to know? The price of what? The price of sushi. Well, that's simple. We'll just look. Oh, wait, but we can't look it up. It doesn't exist yet. And the price of sushi, what would that depend on? Well, the price of fish and the price of sushi chefs. Wait a minute. We're trying to figure out how many to have. And how many, the price of, of sushi, wouldn't that depend on a bunch of other stuff, really complicated stuff, like what? The demand, but how would that be affected by, what other things would affect that demand? The competition of what? Other sushi restaurants, so that's a problem. I don't even know how many that they're going to be. But the, the competition of other types of cuisine, right? I need to know all those prices. And what else do I need to know? I need to know, how about eating at home? Because that's an alternative to eating at sushi. How much does it cost to cook at home? How much fun is it? Or is it a drudge? Is it drudgery? How many appliances do you have that make it easier for you relative to what it used to be? Oh my gosh. And then just think about the sushi chefs. We've got to figure out how, what do they cost? We said, what are their wages? Well, that depends on what? Their alternatives as cooks, but it's not as cooks as well. Other things they might not decide to go into, into being a restaurant person. You think, start thinking about the amount of information you'd have to have, and yet somehow you get to six, and it seems like it's pretty good, but maybe it's way off. And I'd argue it's not way off. And the reason it's not way off is that because this is really what economics is all about. This is the essence of economics, is understanding not how many sushi restaurants there should be in Biloxi, Mississippi, because economics has nothing to say about that explicitly. What it has to say something about is the process by which that whole complex set of people, and it's millions, 
that affect how many sushi restaurants are going to be in Biloxi, because it depends on how many people live in Biloxi, and it depends on what their tastes are, and it depends on their alternatives, and those in turn depend on whether a, there's a lot of Thai people who came to Biloxi for the opportunities. This mind-boggling array of folks who decide, who include eaters at restaurants, workers at restaurants, the fishermen, it includes the investors in restaurants, it includes all kinds of things outside of the food and restaurant business, how all those people aggregate in some weird thing called decide to produce six, that process is what economics is all about. And at the heart of that process, do we have a couple more weeks I could, we could talk about? No, OK. But if we had a couple more weeks, is what we could talk about in a microeconomics or price theory class, you think about fundamentally what are feedback loops that provide information in an economical, and I mean that in a different way than economics, meaning in a, a short and abbreviated way, that provide the information to the deciders on the ground People saying, should I move to Biloxi, should not? What should I eat for dinner tonight, stay home? Those kind of decisions we do understand. When we decide, I can't decide to go out for sushi tonight or Thai or stay home and cook that thing we saw on the cooking show. Those decisions we understand. But what we don't understand very well is how they all aggregate up into this thing called we decided there should be six sushi restaurants in Biloxi. That process is the essence of economics, and it's driven by Feedback loops. It's driven by the fact that there are these built-in, that nobody designed, and nobody decided how they work, but they work really well. These built-in feedback loops that send information to the different deciders on the ground. People decide whether to move to Biloxi, whether to eat what to eat on a Tuesday night, whether to become a sushi chef or a Thai chef, whether to stay in Japan or move to Mississippi. All of that's driven by feedback loops. And you start to think about how complicated that is, which is what the study of economics is. You start thinking about, well, if there are no sushi restaurants in Biloxi and everybody likes them, you can make a lot of money. Open a sushi restaurant and charge a lot, enough to cover your costs. Of course, you don't know that. So somebody has to take a, a leap, a risk, and try that. And if it turns out they're successful and you see they're driving a nice car and they build a nice house for themselves and they send their, their kids to good schools like SMU, you start to realize, oh, well, maybe there's room for a second. And somebody opens a second. And if they open 20, and that's not the right number, meaning there aren't enough people who want to eat sushi to support 20 restaurants. Nobody has to do a study. The committee doesn't have to say, I think we've overexpanded here, because those 20 find they can't keep their price high enough to cover all their costs. There's not enough people coming in, and some of them go out of business. So the profit and loss feedback loop is working all the time. The profit's encouraging people to take chances. The loss is discouraging them when it's the wrong decision. There's the price of sushi is adjusting. The price of fish is adjusting. And people are trying to buy more raw tuna for those tuna rolls. And all of a sudden, there's poor people steered into becoming tuna fishermen, right? There's all these incredible feedback loops working to make this thing work pretty well. So when I say I think six is probably a pretty good number, it's not because I go out and I do a study of an intense, detailed statistical analysis, which you couldn't do in a lifetime. The reason I'm pretty confident that six is a good number is because I know a little bit, not a lot, I know a little bit about the underlying feedback loops that steer that system. And it works pretty well. It's not perfect, but a committee couldn't do it better. It would do it worse. Because it couldn't marshal that information the way that the bottom up, undirected, uncontrolled system does. So let me close with one example, and then I'll do a couple applications, and then we'll turn to questions. So this example is taken uh, directly from my book, uh, The Price of Everything. And I raise the question, what if millions of Americans decide that they want to lead healthier lives? They want to exercise more and eat different kinds of food, <clears throat> which I've been doing recently. It's kind of fun. Decided to be crazy, join the gym, uh, exercise six days a week, stop eating all kinds of carbs, eat a lot more meat. It's a really good idea. When people say this low-fat thing, it's wrong. Totally wrong. I'm an expert, really. I am. Take my word for it. So you do have to be skeptical of these kind of fads. They might not be true. They're based on some sort of scientific thinking, which is uncertain. So be careful. Moderation in all things is probably a good idea. But there are a lot of people like me who are dying in this interesting. So they decide to exercise more and eat better. Now think of the incredible range of stuff that has to happen to let those plans, those decisions by people on the ground, come to reality. New kinds of food in the grocery store. New kinds of grocery stores, right? We have all these different kinds of grocery stores that didn't exist 10 years ago. 
new kinds of running shoes. Unbelievable array of running shoes. You can run like a barefoot caveman. You can with your little finger, you know, your little toesy things. It's, it's an incredible thing. They weigh four ounces, six ounces. You can have big, heavy kinds. They can, they can track your stride. They can make, change your music. Uh, unbelievable. New kinds of clothes. Just the clothing array is, is mind-boggling. New kinds of exercise machines. Videos to go with them, trainers, to show you how to use them. New kinds of bicycles. You can't just have a bicycle. We have a special kind of bike called a spinning bike. More tennis rackets, new kinds of tennis rackets, people to make all these things, work in all these places. You'd think there'd be nothing left in the rest of the economy. We're all focused on the exercise world. It's not what happens. There's lots of stuff going on elsewhere. Who makes sure that the dreams and desires, those plans and actions, don't conflict with each other or with the thousands of other dreams and desires and plans that are underway at the same time? All the resources, the workers, the raw materials that had to be mobilized to make sure that other people's lives weren't disrupted. Who settled the disputes? Who made the decision about how much junk food, how much organic food, how much low carb? Credible. Junk food's better than it used to be. There are more choices in the junk food area. How can we, we didn't say, nobody decided, well, if we're going to do this no carb thing and this healthier thing, of course, you people over here are eating badly, you're going to have to do without. No, they get more choices too. There's more flavors of potato chips. You get organic milk and four kinds of mesquite flavors of potato chips. The dreams of a healthier America didn't shut down the dreams of those who wanted to be couch potatoes. There's more video games. They're better, too. That would have been one way to avoid conflict. We could have shut down some of the unhealthy stuff. We even have biochemists worrying about how to solve your health problems if you want to be a couch potato. Who made sure that Nike would find all the rubber and fabric and workers it needs to cushion the feet of all those runners? While other shoemakers were looking for materials and workers because some TV show said that high heels should be higher and, and a different kind of shoe should be made. How is there seemingly always plenty of the things we want without fights, without chaos, without turmoil? What is the source of the unseen harmony, the order that is everywhere around us? Who is the weaver of dreams? Who makes sure that all the dreams can coexist peacefully? Who makes all the decisions to make that happen? And of course, the answer is there isn't a weaver of dreams. There's no committee. Each of us takes the unique strands of our hopes and dreams and adds them to everyone else's. And somehow they all fit together. And the tapestry of our lives gets more interesting and varied and human. There's been incredible change in human enterprise that we don't notice because we live here and we don't live in China. But hundreds of millions of Chinese have moved from the countryside into the cities, one of the great migrations of human history. A lot of those people send their kids to school now instead of working on the farm. Those kids use pencils. Can you imagine how many more pencils the Chinese people are using compared to 20 years ago? How is it possible that you can go into an office store and get a pencil in America and they don't say, oh, well, you can't get them for two years. The Chinese are using them all. It's not what happens. It's a beautiful thing. Somehow, those decisions get made in a way that works out. Who sends the memo out to put all the effort into motion that makes those dreams coexist? And the answer is nobody does. So how does it work? Well, it's all in the prices and the profits and the losses and the feedback loops that create hidden order that makes the decisions all fit together. Understanding how prices and profits and loss steer resources and decisions is the essence of economics. So if you remember only one thing from this talk, remember that there are things in our lives that are uncontrolled, but not out of control. Think about that for a minute. Think about that paradox. There are many, many things in our lives that are uncontrolled. Nobody's in charge of them, but they're not out of control. They're orderly, and they work really well with other parts of our lives. That's remarkable. Once you start to think about that, you start to see this process, what, what, what some economists call spontaneous order. I, I don't like that phrase so much because it sounds like it's sudden like spontaneous combustion, all of a sudden your TV blows up and it's on fire. That's not what this is about. This is about a very amazing, connected, complex set of interactions from the bottom up rather than the top down. Top down is controlled. It's not controlled. It's uncontrolled, but it's still orderly. It's still, it's not out of control. You'll start to see these processes in your lives. They're everywhere. They're in the restaurant when everybody's talking loudly, creating a certain level of volume. You can't control that. Go to a room, a cocktail party, and go, hey, folks, 
Let's keep it down a little bit. In 30 seconds, it's back, 30, eight seconds, it's back to the exact same level it was before. Now, there are many processes that don't work so well when you leave them alone. My favorite is traffic. Nobody's in charge of traffic, but it's incredibly orderly. It's like a memo goes out, between 6 and 8 this morning, everybody drives slowly. That's what it looks like, all right? If you're late to work because you got stuck in morning traffic, so I said, where were you? Well, I, was, I was just decided to drive really slowly like everybody else. It's not what it is, but that's what it looks like. It looks like somebody says between 6 and 8, I want everybody to go slow and then fast for a while, a few hours, and then around 4 o'clock, slow down everybody, take it easy. Nobody wants to go slow, but hey, you're driving the car, your foot's on the gas, isn't it your decision? No, nope, it's not my decision, I have no choice. It's not in my control, totally out of control and not working so well. Because the feedback loops aren't there to, dis to discourage people from getting on between 4 and 6. There's no prices, just like there are no feedback loops for, you, in you invent a good word, you sit around all day going, hmm, and around would be a good noun for an unethical moron. I'll use that. You don't get any reward for that. A little bit. You could blog about it, maybe get a following. You could have a new word of the day. People could sort of you get a, a, some kind of fan club around it. But in general, you don't get rich from creating a new word. And so the incentives don't work so well. You don't get poor uh, by getting on the highway, you just slow yourself down a little bit, but you slow everybody else down behind you, and that's not taken into your calculation. So the feedback loops for Google and traffic are imperfect, not as good as the number of sushi chefs. You create a new food sensation, you become a great, cook, cook, you create a, a great cooking show, you get rich. That encourages people to try to find them. That feedback loop works like a charm. It's phenomenal. You create a shoe with five toes that look like a glove, you might go broke, you might get rich, you don't know. You take a chance and the market decides. You don't decide, not up to you, not up to a committee. Our choices, we decide those things and they work really, really well. And of course, if you do decide to steer these things, one of the great lessons of economics is you get unintended consequences. If you take a complex system of this kind of process, this organic process, and you try to intervene in it, you think you can steer it, you can't. So just to take a few obvious examples, take your body. Oh, I know how to get thin, I'll just skip breakfast. Doesn't work, does not work. Why doesn't it work? Because your body says, I'm really hungry now. It does two things. First of all, your metabolism, which is not under your control, gets at you and it makes you hungrier for lunch than you were otherwise and you overeat at lunch when you think you're cutting out calories at breakfast, right? It just doesn't work. You have traffic. Oh, that's easy to fix. We'll just add some lanes to the highway. Doesn't work. They refill up, right? It could still be a good idea, but it doesn't get rid of the traffic problem because the underlying connections haven't been fixed. So when we try to intervene in these systems, we get unintended consequences. So I want to close with an about the financial crisis, and then we'll open it up to questions. In financial markets, in investing and risk taking, the feedback loops are very straightforward. They are the feedback loops of profit and loss. The profits encourage risk taking, the losses encourage prudence. They're very powerful. They don't seem to have worked very well in the last few years. A standard narrative of the financial crisis is that we left markets to regulate themselves and they ran amok. We let things alone, we let us decide these things, and as a result, we built too many houses and invested too much in housing. And some have concluded that this uncontrolled process is not very effective. Could be, it's possible. But it is important to remember that we did not leave feedback loops and financial markets alone over the last 30 years. Since 1984, the government in the form of the Fed and the Treasury and the White House have broken one of the key feedback loops of investing, which is the loss side, for lenders. We've let large lenders come to believe to some extent, not always, but to some extent, that if you lend money, if you're a large institution, and you lend money to someone else to take risky bets with that money, you're not really putting your money at risk. You will get your money back, even if it turns out badly. It's one of the most destructive things we've done to capitalism, maybe ever. We've said, We've taken the one group that cares about the downside, which are the lenders and creditors, right? If you're a bondholder, a lender, a creditor, all you care about is getting your principal back and your promised payments. You don't get any of the upside. As the bets get riskier and riskier, all that does is 
r raise the, co the probability of losing your money. You don't get any increased return if you're a bondholder or a lender. So what we did, so bondholders and lenders, they are the watchdogs of recklessness. In our system, they are the decision maker who, when it gets too risky, says, uh-uh, I'm done. But what we've done is we've said, if you're that decision maker and your investments are getting riskier and riskier, they're being funded with your money, you might get all your money back anyway. What does that do? We've subsidized recklessness. So it's not surprising that as a result, we have seen bad decisions. Maybe it's not the only reason. There's a lot of reasons. But effectively, we've taken the culture of the financial sector and we've destroyed the natural feedback loops that would have discouraged imprudent decisions. When you socialize losses and privatize profits, you get recklessness. Why would we do that? Why would we have policies that do that? And the answer to me is that the political system is the ultimate emergent system that we foolishly and romantically think of as we decide. <laughs> but it is not. We, the people, decide. That's not true in the sense that we usually use the word. That we got sat around to decide, yeah, we should subsidize recklessness. That's a good idea. No. That decision emerged through the natural feedback loops of our political system which I would argue are not very healthy right now for a whole variety of reasons. We can talk some more about that. There is no we, the people, in political decisions. It's politicians who, in their own emergent process, come to make decisions. If their incentives are lousy, they'll do what's best for them rather than what's best for you and me. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much and open it up for questions. We have plenty of time. We're doing great. Russ. Am I on? Yeah. yeah. It seems to me that we're kind of hardwired to believe that somebody is in charge. Yep. And we see that very evidently in uh, the political process. You know, the president or the, the Congress, they run the country. Yeah, he's going to run the country, yeah. And the question is, how do we overcome this? I mean, that seems to be the, the thing that economics is all about, overcoming that. And just as a methodological issue, can we overcome it with calculus and diagrams, or do we need yeah, poetry? Dif do we need verbal? No, we need differential equations. That's, that's what you left out. Uh, <laughs> now, um, that, that's a hard question. Uh, l let me just, uh, one of my favorite metaphors that illustrates what Dwight's talking about is uh, something I heard from a CNN reporter. He said, the economy and the way politicians think of the economy reminds me of a kid who's playing a video game, okay, like Space Invaders. Who will know what Space Invaders is? Raise your hand. We have a certain age to play Space Invaders. I don't know what the right modern uh, version is. But in the old days, you would go to a place where they would have a big box. In the old, old days, it was called a pinball machine, okay? <laughs> But then it evolved, and it became more electronic, and it was called Space Invaders or something else. And it's a box, and on the box is a screen, and on the screen are things happening, usually things blowing up other things. And he said the economy and politicians, politicians are like a little kid who goes to play the video game, and he's hitting the flippers or he's pushing the buttons, but he doesn't realize you have to put money in the machine to get it to work. And all he's watching is the, what's effectively an ad. Right? It's scrolling through. Things are blowing up. But he thinks that his hitting the flippers is doing it because he's under the illusion that he's running the game. But he's not. He's not running the game. The I image I like, the other image I like, which I think is a very useful image because it really captures, you ask me, how do you dispel this romance that I think is very uh, dangerous and false, that someone's in charge. Oh, we don't have to worry. They're in charge. And it's the Wizard of Oz. Right? The Wizard of Oz, you got a bunch of people and a dog who got a tough break and are trying to change their lives. So rather than saying, I got to look into myself and figure out what to do to make the world a better place, they figure I'll just go to the great and powerful Oz and he'll fix everything. And that's not how life works. 
And it's a beautiful movie, right? I've seen it way too many times to enjoy it the way I saw it the first three times, right? But if you think about the lesson of that movie, the lesson of that movie is that if you want to change yourself, it has to be you. That's the way life works. It'd be great if there were that magic pill that could let you lose weight, get smarter, et cetera. But you, it isn't the way the world is. You got to work. You got to transform yourself. No one can transform you. There's no shortcut, right? And the more important lesson is there's no man behind the curtain, right? You want the, oh, where, where's the, where are all the levers? There aren't any. There are no buttons. It just looks that way. And the guy who's got the big fancy hat and all the bells and whistles and the explosives and the fireworks, he wants you to think that he's in charge and he's really important. Because when you think that, you know what you do? You bow down to him. You treat him as at least half a god, if not all of a god. And he's who you worship. Because he's where salvation comes from, but he's just a man. And one of the things, really, that economics does teach you, and it's hard to learn it through equations, but everybody's different, right? Some people do learn that way. Other people learn, I think, through graphs. Some le learn through equations. Some learn through stories. I think most of us learn through stories, which is why I like to tell stories, because I think that's where we're hard hardwired to remember and perceive and the way our brains. I think we learn through stories and we learn through conversation, because that's what most of our history was about as, as human beings, right? We didn't have a lot of differential equations in, in our in our ancestry. But that's what economics is about, is learning that there's no man behind the curtain, there's no magic solution, there's no shortcut. And that impulse to believe that there is, is very strong within us. Fight it. It's, it's, it's an illusion. There's no man behind the curtain. That doesn't mean there aren't good and bad policies. Of course, there are some policies that are better than others, but there are no magic policies, folks. You know, and so when a politician, which it always makes me nauseous, says, uh, I'm going to create X million jobs. What the heck is he talking about? There's no such thing. Now, forget the obvious thing. that They don't employ people directly in the jobs that they're talking about. It's not literally their employing of the people. But, you know, claiming you created so many jobs, with apologies to your governor or to the President of the United States or to Mitt Romney, who are all making the same kind of silly claims, is to pretend that, oh yeah, I pushed the right button. And that's just not the way it works. And thinking it works that way is not a good idea. Other questions? Yeah, Jay. Um, sure. High points and low points that I see economically in the next five to 10 years. Uh, you know, it's just funny, I was just, uh, we were talking about Greece this morning, earlier at breakfast. Uh, you know, what's going to happen there? Is Connor, are you still here? Where are you? So, so Connor was talking earlier about how, you know, it's good sometimes to leave a place that's got economic problems and come to a place that's economically healthier. And that may be what happens to, to Greece. What we need to do for Greece, you know, what we need to send them suitcases. <laughs> you know, pack up, folks. <laughs> you're you're on a bad <laughs> ship. We we're talking about ships earlier. It's not like, oh, how do I fix this sinking ship? It's going down. It's going to be ugly. Uh, the next five or 10 years, I really have no idea, um, other than to get that nice uh, joke about Greece in. I, I, um, I'm, worried about, I'm worried about the country. Um, I'm worried about our economic vision that, that many economists have, that, that Michael doesn't look up to, that is very common, that the way to the way to create wealth is to spend. Um, this is a Keynesian idea that is deeply appealing to economists. Uh, it's deeply appealing to politicians. Thank God it's getting less appealing to everyday people who seem to be skeptical of it. Doesn't seem to work very well. It's complicated, it may have, but it doesn't seem to work very well. Um, so I don't know what's gonna happen. I'm hoping we, uh, I, here, here's what I favor. I favor adulthood, acting like a grown up. It's hard, folks. I know it's hard. Some of you are on the cusp of adulthood. Um, but adulthood is about meeting your obligations and um, um, it, it not getting a do-over. Right? We give our four-year-olds a do-over. Our four-year-old makes a mistake. Our 10-year-old makes a mistake. Our 15-year-old makes a mistake. We give them a do-over, unless it's a bad mistake. As long as we say, you've got to pay a price. You've got to learn a lesson. Uh, if we always tell our kids and we always tell our people, 
uh, you always get a do-over, especially if you're rich and in the financial sector. That's a bad way to go. So I'm hoping we might learn that lesson. Uh, that would be a good thing. And I encourage all of you to help encourage others to act like grown-ups. That's, um, I think that's important. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, what do, what's my, uh, how much do I think public education is part of the problem of encouraging people to think about problem solving? Uh, you know, we are hardwired, wisely so, to think about problem solving being solved by intentional action rather than emergent order. It, it is an uh, inherently good thing to, to focus on the dishes uh, if you want them out of the sink and clean, to focus on an educational plan if you want to make a success in your life, right? You don't want to say, well, I'm not going to go to college because it'll all work out. Right? That, that's something we as parents work to tell our kids that that's a dangerous idea. Every once in a while, we, it, it works, right? And we got all these prominent examples of people who drop out of school and thrive. We, it, we only see the successful ones, right? We see Sergey Brin drops out of grad school, starts Google. He did pretty well. Steve Jobs did pretty well. You don't see the thousands who didn't do well. I'm about some of that at breakfast. It just, that's the reality. So it's a good idea to have a plan. It's a good idea to look for the right buttons to push for your own life. But it's a bad idea for us to do it collectively. And I think you know, one of the fundamental reasons is uh, you know, my favorite economist is F.A. Hayek. And he wrote about it endlessly, that the information necessary to make those decisions from the top down is very difficult. And the economic system marshals that knowledge, that information, in a way that a committee can't in most settings. And that's an incredibly powerful lesson. I think I blame our public schools for other stuff. Uh, I, I think our education system in the United States is it's horrible at the K through 12 if you live in the inner city. If you live in a rich suburb, it's pretty good K through 12, but it's not great. It's not designed. It's also emergent, but it is somewhat controlled by the political process. So as a result, the, some of the feedback loops are broken there. You, we give it away, which I think is a terrible mistake. People don't pay for it, so they treat it the way we treat things that are given to us, not very valuably, not very carefully. Um, I don't think our college system is, is that successful. It's the best in the world. Uh, it is also the most emergent of all the university systems. Most university systems outside the United States are run from the top down. They're public uh, systems. But I think this world, and this is the world I live in, the world where I stand in front of you and talk to you, and occasionally I let you get a word in, <laughs> right? That's our educational model. That's changing radically right now. And universities that don't prepare for it are going to get their clocks clean. They got all this unbelievably expensive brick and mortar meat space stuff. And it's going to be just trashed in the marketplace of education. Now, what this system does really well is give 18 to 22-year-olds a relatively sheltered place to get a little bit wild and explore their identity, right? That's what it's really good at. Sorry, that is what it's really good at. Along the way, you do have some intellectual stimulation called, called classes, right? But what's going to happen when those classes are best delivered via the web? Now, that's not going to happen in every field. There are a lot of classes where f this thing is very valuable. Economics might be one of them, not the mathematical kind of economics. That you can learn on a blackboard, on a tablet, on your, at your own speed with exams and self-tutored on, on the web. But this kind of storytelling economics, I think, has some future. Although you could watch this on a screen up till now. We had some good Q&A. We could have done that on a screen. That model is unbelievably expensive. I'll just tell you one quick example. Uh, I don't know if you saw this fascinating story. Uh, Stanford professor Sebastian Thrun teaches a course on artificial intelligence to 200 students at Stanford, decides to teach it on the web to anybody who wants to take it, and 160,000 people sign up for it on the web. 22,000 take the class through its completion with exams, homework, et cetera. 248 do get a perfect score. None of them are at Stanford. They're all international on the web. More people take the course in Lithuania than take it at Stanford. P 
people take it in Afghanistan and cut through war-torn areas to get to an internet connection. Guy has such a good experience doing this as a teacher, quits his job, starts a company called Udacity, Audacity without the A, Udacity. And February 20th, there's still time, you can sign up to learn how to write a search engine from scratch, he claims, that 500,000 people he thinks will take. You want to be one of them? You can. I'm sure you have a fine computer science program here, but that's a threat. That's a real threat in a good kind of way. There's nothing like creative destruction. It's part of what makes capitalism the great changer of our lives. Yeah, back. Because the people on the committee are going to be smarter than me, right? Because I don't have the highest IQ in the country, neither do you, right? We'll just get the 10 highest IQ people, and they'll obviously do better telling me what to do than I could for myself because they're smarter than me. Now, if life really worked like that, that would be a really good idea. Of course, that isn't how life really works. And one of the biggest problems with that model is that the people who make the decisions have an incentive to do what? Now, Marcy and I used to be at Washington University in St. Louis together. And this is a story about... Uh, Restraint. I get a letter from the governor's wife. See, I don't know if you got one, Marcy, but I get a letter from the governor's wife. I get excited. The governor's wife. Why would she write me a letter? And it's a letter about how I need to vaccinate my kids. I just had a child. Somebody told the governor's wife. Wasn't that nice? She knew I had a kid, and she wrote me a letter. And she said, you know, it's a really good idea to vaccinate. You know who paid for that letter? I did. So it was really, I know it was for me. I know she meant well. And I know, actually, I already knew it was good to vaccinate my kids. So I found it a little strange that she paid with my money to send me a letter to tell me to do something I already wanted to do. But she did. And I wrote her back a letter. <laughs> and I said, Jean, right? Turn hand. Dear Jean, I'm so touched at your affection for my children, the next, my, my new child. When you, next time you're in town, perhaps you could, my wife and I don't get out very often now because it's babysitting is expensive, perhaps you could sit for our daughter and get to know her name to start with, and maybe you could get some kind of bond and learn more about her and find out what's best for her. Because I'm sure that you have our best interests at heart, even though you don't know a thing about my daughter, not a thing. And I live with her, love her, and care about her in a way that you cannot imagine. So it went on from there. <laughs> I was so proud of that letter. And I thought it would be best to publish it in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, <laughs> where others could enjoy my affection for my new friend, Jean. And my wife said, don't do that. <laughs> That's the restraint. She said, you know, I, I think it's best to get, you got it out of your system. It's probably better not to submit it to the Post-Dispatch. My answer was I, I was, I gave a very calm answer. Why? Come on, it's so good. I found it very cathartic and therapeutic to have written the letter. Um, but she said other people would have a different impression. And uh, this is one of the many cases where I listened to my wife and was happy later that, that I did. Uh, so committees, a couple things seriously about health. Oh, that was serious. It just was trying to tell in a different way. But the, the serious remark I'd make about health care is this. I love when people say, well, look, you can't use the free market for health care. Look how badly it works. <laughs> As if we have a free market in health care now. In 1960, I think, I don't have these numbers exactly, but th this is in the ballpark. In 1960, every dollar of health care that Americans, the average amount, that was paid out of pocket for a dollar of healthcare was something like 50 to 60 cents. I can't remember, maybe it was 65, maybe it was 70. So 70 cents came out, let's say, or 60 cents came out of the patient's pocket. The other 30 or 40 was paid for by someone else, either the government or an insurance company. That's down to about 15 cents, right? So again, we're in a case where, like the financial sector, people are spending other people's money. One of the great insights of Milton Friedman is that people spend other people's money less carefully than they spend their own. Of course, many things that people spend with other people's money for health care is life-saving and wonderful and glorious, and that's good. 
but a lot of it's not good. A lot of it's not useful. I remember the time I got a uh, sore throat that wouldn't go away. I went to the, this again was in St. Louis, Washington University, world-class medical system. I go to a, a throat specialist there, takes out this incredibly fancy piece of technology called an ah stick, piece of wood. He looks down my throat. He says, I don't see anything. Then he said, but let's make sure. Great, I said. I want to make sure, don't you? He takes a, a device. It's a long uh, um, sleeve with a stick in it, puts it down my throat, and there's my throat up on a Sony TV in his office. Never said, you want to do this? Because, you know, you know what it cost me? Ten bucks. That was the copay. Whether we use the ah stick or the $10,000 camera on a screen. And we could have broadcast it live on YouTube. I mean, there's so many potentially exciting things that, that maybe he didn't see, uh, the, the, the pilot, but, but maybe someone else would. Let's give it a chance. Those decisions are, are made in a way that I think are wrong. Now, there's a benefit to it. Don't misunderstand me. It's nice that I didn't have to worry about my throat at all. But if he'd said to you, do you want to, let's look closer. It'll cost you $600. I would have said, why don't we wait a week and see if it goes away? Now, uh, during that week, I'd have had, I would have had anxiety, but I also would have had $600. Instead, what I did is I made somebody else pay $600 for my comfort. I think that's a bad system. I don't like that system. That's what we've done with healthcare in the United States. Now, the other point I would make is that, yes, I'm a flawed person. I have behavioral issues. I have meta, uh, mental processes that are warped and strange and the product of my childhood and my environment, and I delude myself. I have all kinds of problems about healthcare. But so do the people who would be the experts. And they wouldn't care about me. They wouldn't have an incentive to care about me. In a world of saints and gods, put them on the committee. I don't know very many of those. I'd rather make my decisions myself. Yeah. What is what? Uh -huh. No, I haven't. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Nassim Taleb. How many people here have read some of Nassim Taleb's books? Raise your hand. He's an interesting person. Um, he has some interesting ideas about how to deal with the uncertainty of, of investment. Uh, they appeal to me, but I'm, I'm not totally convinced of them, but they're interesting. Uh, you know, he's the guy who wrote The Black Swan. It's his book, and he argues that a lot of times things that look safe aren't. You get sandbagged and slept, slammed upside the head by something you didn't anticipate or look for. It's a great book. I encourage you to read it. His first book's better, even Fooled by Randomness. They're both great. He has a new one coming out called Anti-Fragility that'll be phenomenal. Uh, I've had the privilege of interviewing him four times on my podcast, so if, you wanna, if, you're, a, if you're not a reader, uh, as Michael was talking about, not everybody reads anymore, so if you just want to listen while you're jogging or mowing the lawn or walking the dog, you can hear those at Econ Talk uh, at no charge, monetary charge. So his ideas are you know, basically things that look safe aren't. You ought to have a what he calls a barbell strategy of incredibly safe stuff and then a few really risky things. So you sleep well at night because of the safe stuff, and every once in a while this thing turns out okay and you get a little bit of enhancement to your portfolio. That's tempting. Uh, I'm heading that way. I'm, I see myself as my father's son. My father, born in 1930, child of the Depression, would never invest in, in stocks because of that. And as a result, was a junk bond buyer because that's better than stocks. Because he couldn't take, he couldn't accept a low rate of return, right? So I think for me, my future as an investor, I'm now contaminated by this le last few years. Um, I still believe that index mutual funds are a really good idea. They beat the alternative. But I'm un increasingly uneasy as I get older that, that that's not the, a good place for my money and my ratio is changing a lot. Um, so that's just, that's just me. There are no good places to invest right now. It's allows to me. It's a lousy time. And uh, I would just counsel patients and hope that things get better because the search for yield is a dangerous search. <laughs> dangerous search. Yeah. 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 Um, the question is, what is the effect of governments? Uh, I, I would call it uh, ignoring the rule of law and uh, replacing it with the rule of men, which is uh, uh, inherently dangerous. Again, very similar to what I'm talking about today. That you, know, you think a committee of experts would do better. That we should occasionally. It's worth it to get rid of contracts. 
And I think what you do there is you're slowly or fraying the fabric of the system. The costs are unseen. They're intangible, but they're real. Um, I think those are terrible, terrible decisions. Uh, you know, and, and the rationale for them are, make me laugh. You know, the idea that we saved X million jobs in Michigan because we, we, didn't, let, uh, we didn't let Chrysler and GM go through bankruptcy. Even if they had disappeared, which they wouldn't have, but even if they had disappeared, their suppliers would have sold parts to other people who would have had their demand increase, like Ford. It's an interesting question. Is it moral to buy a GM car? It doesn't cross many people's minds, but uh, and I'm a Honda driver generally, but I've owned a Ford in my life. And I, if I bought an American car again, I'd buy a Ford before I'd buy a GM or a Chrysler. I think that's a terrible precedent. Um, so I think it's very costly. Yeah. Yeah. The problem with our political system is that our political representatives aren't representing us anymore. They're representing themselves. Yep. If we can't do that thing, then sooner or later, people are going to catch on to that, and that we will inevitably be forced to almost take over the government and get back. Well, we don't know how to do that. I mean, that, the, the problem is, um, I believe deep down, and, and again, this is just philosophical speculation. There's nothing scientific about any of this, but I believe deep down our problems come from us. We get the political system we deserve. If we ask our politicians to bail us out, we shouldn't be surprised that they do it sometimes. What changed sometime in America, and I, you know, you could say it's, again, this is sort of pop history, pop philosophy. Sometime in the eight, between 1890 and 1920, people started to believe that experts could steer things, right? It's called the, you know, the progressive movement. Technocratic expertise in engineering was doing, and, and other areas were making tremendous strides. And people said, well, we should run our society the way we build a bridge. Not thinking about the fact that building a bridge is not like running a society. Building a bridge is like the dishes. You do have to plan it. It doesn't execute itself. But running an economy, it doesn't work very well that way. But we came to believe that, and we demanded politicians who acted that way. Right? The activism of the, of the federal government, as opposed to even the local or state government, starts around the 30s with a disastrous economic turn that we still don't fully understand. And we explain, depending on our ideologies and biases, right? If you're a big government person, you blame it on capitalism. If you're a capitalist, you blame it on big government. Uh, so I blame it on big government. But you know, I admit it's a bias. It's, not a, it's an ideological belief. I, don't have a, I can bring evidence for it. So can the other side. Um, but, you know, if you ask for a do-over, and who doesn't want a do-over, you know? Oh, everybody wants a do-over. But if it's culturally acceptable, which it is now in America to ask for a do-over, politicians are going to respond to that demand. So the simple answer, which I think is wrong, but looks good on paper, is we need to regain respect for the Constitution, the limits of government, et cetera. But why did we lose? constitutionality? Why is that our system has so little respect for the Constitution? Why do politicians swear an oath on it and then fail to uphold it? And the answer is because we ask them not to. So I believe fundamentally that the road to prosperity and rich human existence, and prosperity isn't what counts. What counts is all of us having a chance to express ourselves as fully as possible. That's what the economy should serve. That's what our political system should do, is to liberate us <coughs> to express ourselves in as fully as possible as human beings. The way to do that is it's up to us. And the way I think we get there is by encouraging people, our children and our family and our friends, to think about the virtues of leaving things alone, even when you have a short run gain from doing something that looks good. Uh, and um, I have hope. I'm not, I'm not a pessimist. I think we can move in that direction. It's not going to be easy. Uh, we've gone a long way down the other road. Uh, but you know, right now there's a lot of people who are suddenly starting to think that this system doesn't seem to be serving us very well. It seems to be serving a very small group. Uh, so the Occupy Wall Street movement, I think, is they're onto something. Unfortunately, their solution's bad, and they don't understand the underlying cause. They think it's some inherent capitalist thing that rich people can grab all the money. It's hard to do that without government's help, and I think governments help rich people grab a lot of the money. Um, and we look in the we look in the wrong places. We look in the wrong places.
Any other questions? One more over here. Yeah. Where do innovators come from? Um, I don't think we understand that process very well. I'm sure you have some fine classes here on it that can help people liberate their own innovative side and, and learn some of the mechanics of the infrastructure that makes innovation possible. Venture capital is a huge, one of our great advantages in America is the venture capital system, which by the way is the product of our willingness to let people get filthy rich. Right? It's a great thing. You, let, you tell people, you take risks, and you get rich, you get to keep a lot of it. And if you make bad decisions and you lose your money, too bad. That's what the venture capital system is. And that's great. And it's worked very well. It, here's how well it works, right? What th a great venture capitalist, investor, three out of 10 is, are home runs, three out of 10 are mediocre, and four out of 10 go broke. That's how hard it is to understand what makes a great innovator, right? So we don't, it's not science. We don't understand it very well. And um, it's something, it's a gift that, that human beings have to be creative. And the more we liberate that gift, I think the better our lives are. And uh, we ought to be thinking about how to keep that gift going, because it's special. Well, we hope that uh, this will not be the only time you come to speak to us. We would like to have you back regularly. Um, as you can tell, you know, this is just the beginning of people really wanting to hear what you have to say. Um, and in the meantime, before you do come back, I want to let everybody know that you do have access to 300, or they would call them, po 300 yeah, podcasts, podcasts um, available to you at Econ Talk. Also, you've got to watch this video, especially this one that was about the current ideological debate going on in America, Kane versus Hyde. Second round, for reading, I would, re I would recommend you begin with the choice. It's compelling, you'll get hooked and you'll want to read everything else. Many of you have probably already read those things. But until next time, Russ, we thank you so much for coming and enlightening us very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you.